Uh, otherwise, you know, two, let's see, it was actually three weeks ago, but the last two times that I have taught, I have now skipped scripture in the midst of the, uh, the message. And so, uh, three weeks ago, like two times ago when I talked, nobody said anything about it except for my wife. She was the only one that said anything about it. So then, you know, I brought it up last week and pointed the whole thing out and even shared like ministry philosophy with you and did it again. So, ne you know, needless to say, about 500 of you pointed it out <laughs> this week. And I am told that there may even be a sign among the congregation today. Um, yeah, that's, that's my understanding, okay? Hopefully, we're not going to have use of the sign. I need to break a streak here today. They, uh, that's, that's what we're going for. We're trying to bust a streak here. You know, there was a country song that said a sign meant you were an idiot. Y'all remember that? That's kind of the vibe that I'm getting from that. We'll, we'll have to see about the sign. But, but let me tell you, there's one thing I kind of want to teach you before I start teaching today, and, and it's this. I've actually taught Daniel 5 several times over the years, and some of you have been here when I taught Daniel 5 to our church. It was back in our Cleveland Middle days. How many of y'all are Cleveland Middle Chapel people? Let me see the hands right now. All right, there you go. So we actually taught Daniel 5 uh, as a topical message uh, back in Cleveland Middle days here. And I've taught it several times. But do y'all know, I hear this all the time. I hear this so much in our ultra-religious, you know, area that we're in with all of us that are, you know, that do Bible study and devotionals and all those kinds of things. And it comes out like this. Well, I mean, I've read that before. I understand that. I know that. I've done that before. Do y'all know what I mean? Do you ever get tricked into that? Like when you come across a scripture, a passage, whatever, a bunch of you do, just like I do. I want y'all to know, I did not go back and look at any old messages or any old outlines or anything like that. I went into the text as though I had never read it before and studied it. And God blessed my time of preparation. And I'm bringing my best to you today from the work. Whether I skip verses again tonight, today or not, I'm bringing my best, okay? And I want you guys to approach the scriptures in the same way. It does not matter how many times you read a passage. If that's where the Lord has you, His Holy Spirit is your teacher, and He can teach you something through it, unless we set our hearts up in pride to say, I understand and know everything about these verses that I could possibly ever know. You know what I'm saying? Amen? So let's pay attention with humble hearts today and see what the Lord does out of the scriptures. All right? Let's pray. Father God, we invite your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit to fall in this place. As I said, Father, you are our instructor. You are our counselor. You are our teacher. Father, humble our hearts before you today that you would be able to teach us and instruct us and convict us and do anything it is that you desire to do in each of our lives. And Father, as best we know how, we humble ourselves before you in this time and in your presence. And we ask you to work in power in our lives by your word and through your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, and we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, before we go any further this morning, I want to welcome you to another edition of Chapel Karaoke. How many of y'all have played Chapel Karaoke with us before? A few of y'all? All right, not, not tons, just a few, okay? Another edition of Chapel Karaoke. Here's how this works. When I put my hand up in the air, I'm going to sing you the first lyrics of the song. And when I point at you guys, that's when y'all are going to have to jump in, okay? And if you choose not to, then this just becomes a terribly awkward moment where the pastor is trying to get us to do something, and we've captured it on video forevermore that we can just laugh at it over and over again. I'm going to risk that. So if you're going to play along today, you have to actually sing it back to me if you know the lyrics when I point to you. Are you ready? Are you ready? By the way, I'm not a singer. I do not claim to be a singer, if y'all know that about me now. But I do like to have fun, all right? Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. There you go. We got a few of y'all. All right, give those guys a hand. Now, I do understand I have grace for some of y'all because how many of y'all have no idea you have never heard anything that we just sang right now? Raise your hands. Like, I get it. I understand. I, I understand. Like, last time we did this, it was Journey, okay? 
And it felt like I was at a football game on a Saturday night in Athens. You know what I'm saying? Tennessee fans don't sing after the first half. But anyway, it's beside the point, okay? <laughs> my bad, my bad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> So last time it was Journey and everybody kind of got along with that. This one I know, that's a little bit of an obscure country song that many people don't know. But it is the title of our message today. The title of the message out of Daniel 5 is, Lord, it's hard to be humble. And that very much is the topic, not only of chapter 5, but also of chapter 4 that preceded this today. Okay, We're examining this topic through the lens of a dream that was given to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, but also the events that we're going to look at with another king of Babylon in chapter 5 today. But we also have to understand this is also about us. You see, Scripture is preserved for our instruction. These things about Babylon, thousands of years ago, on the eastern half of the globe, in these other languages and traditions and all these things, were preserved by God through the generations for my instruction and your instruction. And so we have to pay close attention to the lessons that God's trying to teach us by His Holy Spirit through His Word. And as it relates to pride, just a couple of things out of the Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 29, 23 says a man's pride will bring him low. But here's the good news. A humble spirit will obtain honor. And as a reminder of a scripture that we talked about last week, James 4, 6 goes on to say, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud. Other scriptures say that he hates pride. God hates pride pride according to the scriptures but it says in James 4 6 again the good news is he gives grace to the humble he hates pride he's opposed to it he draws against pride as a as a, a conquering army is the idea as terms of war he stands against it in all of his might but he gives grace to the humble that should lead us to a question if God hates pride, if he stands against it, it's like a military term, like an army, how can I avoid that? How is it that I can humble myself so that God will not stand against me? That's the question that we're going to answer today. At the end today, we're going to talk about very direct ways, according to Scripture, very, very practical ways, according to the Scripture, that we can actively humble ourselves so that we can be the beneficiaries of God's grace rather than be set in opposition against Him. We're going to start this morning by backing up a verse into Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. Here's what it says. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This was the conclusion of Nebuchadnezzar after the events, and we're going to recap some of those because of chapter 5 today, but after the events of chapter 4 and the dream that he had. Now, as we move into chapter 5, I want to introduce you into a little time uh, skip ahead. We got a little flash forward. We're moving ahead into the future here. In terms of time, we're jumping forward from chapter 4 into chapter 5. We believe somewhere between 20 and 25 years into the future. Nebuchadnezzar is no longer the king. He has died. The king is Belshazzar. Right now, the Persian, the combined forces of the Median and Persian army are outside of the gates of Babylon. They have already conquered all of the provinces. They've already conquered all the territories. They've already conquered everywhere else. And the army is gathered outside the gates of Babylon, besieging the city. And Belshazzar and his nobles and all the people have gathered inside to see if they can wait out this siege. Now you may ask, well, if the Persian and Median and Persian army is so great, if Cyrus, who is the leader of this army, is so great, why, why can't they just destroy Babylon? Well, have you ever read any of the tales of the history of Babylon the city? There was a Greek historian named Herodotus. Herodotus said that the walls of the city of Babylon were 335 feet tall. He says that they were 85 feet thick. Thick, okay? 
I'm talking about thick. They were 85 feet wide. He goes on to say that they were 56 miles long, the walls around the city. He, he would give it, he would basically say that the city of Babylon was about the size of present day Chicago. Now, if you read his notes, he didn't say Chicago because Chicago didn't exist yet. I don't want you to get confused. This is an ancient Greek guy, okay? Talking about the territory, like that size of the city of Chicago. This is a major city with an impenetrable wall that was around the city. Now, I do want you to understand, if you go do your reading, a lot of people say that the Greek historians, they were, they were fibbing a little bit. There was a little bit of hyperbole there. Most historians will say it was about a quarter of that. But if you want to divide that by four, the basic idea was that this city had a wall around it that was at least 80 feet tall all the way around it. That was probably 20, 25 feet thick all the way around it. They had gates of bronze that were legendary, iron or bars of iron that covered certain places that were places of legend. This was a wall that was impenetrable. You could not scale it. You could not get through it. You could not destroy it, the Euphrates River actually flowed through the city of Babylon underneath one of the places of the wall. So the city had constant access to water so that they could irrigate, so that they could grow crops, so that they could raise animals, they could raise their own food, they could take care of themselves, they could sustain themselves from inside the safety and security of their city against any foreign invasion. You get the picture? And this is the picture right now as we go into Daniel chapter 5. To go along with the time references, I need you to understand, because we see these things in our minds a little bit, right? So much time has passed from the beginning of Daniel. We're talking somewhere between 60 and 70 years have passed since the events of Daniel 1 where Nebuchadnezzar goes to Judah and besieges it, all right? Daniel is no longer a 14, 15, or 16-year-old boy. Daniel is more like 80, 82, 84-ish. You know, he's somewhere in that vicinity in his early 80s. And this is the setting that we step into now in Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink for them. Let me make a little historical note here. Nebuchadnezzar, we do not believe, was the actual birth father of Belshazzar. This was a term in many cultures throughout many generations that people would refer to about kings that came before them. Any king of Babylon could refer to the kings that came before him as his fathers. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar was this guy's grandfather. More than likely, they might have just simply been connected by a couple of marriages among family there or who knows what. Sometimes the kings would marry certain relatives to strengthen their hold on the throne. But this was probably not a direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. But he was in the kingly line. Verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now what's happening here? I want you to remember... When Nebuchadnezzar attacked Judah, he was obviously not a God-fearing man. You can debate whether or not he was saved back in chapter 4. I have already told you my opinion. But when he took on and destroyed Judah in the temple back before that, he was a pagan king practicing polytheism, worshiping all kinds of gods. And one of the things that he did on one of those conquests of Judah was to go into the temple and take out the consecrated vessels used only in the worship of God, these vessels that were holy, and take them back to his land and put them in the temple of his gods. And what that symbolized was Nebuchadnezzar saying, my God or my gods are greater than the Hebrew God your, your vessels show that your God is at the foot of my God. In a sense, almost worships my God. My God is sovereign. My God is supreme. These are very spiritual symbols that we're talking about when you talk about the vessels. Now, 
as I walk through this passage today, I want y'all to know that I will be making some inferences into the passage in terms of the tone, in terms of the attitude, in terms of the motives of the responses of things that are going on in here. And I want you to understand that the inferences I'm going to make, that means opinions, by the way, but the inferences that I'm going to make are around the basis that this King Belshazzar is a man who is filled with pride. And that is absolutely scripturally true. So what's going on in these verses where Belshazzar is throwing a party with a thousand of his nobles drinking wine in their presence with his wives and his concubines among them, and he calls for the vessels of the house of God to be brought out so that he and his nobles and his wives and his concubines can all drink from them. There is some thought historically that this was a very odd scene, that a lot of times the king, he may not be present at these wild, huge, lavish parties, and that's typically what they were in these cultures. He usually had a little smaller group around for him. But in this case, Belshazzar is there with all of his greatest nobles, a thousand of them, and he has his wives and his concubines present, and then he calls for the vessels of God to be brought out so that they can all drink wine around them. What does it look like he's doing right now? It looks like, I'm thinking another movie reference in my mind. I don't know if y'all will pick it up or not. Maybe like the country song from a little bit earlier. But I get the idea that Belshazzar is kind of toasting himself with a vessel from the house of God in his hand filled with wine while the Median and Persian army is outside the gates and he's trying to build up his bravado, build up his courage, build up his leadership, show his nobles that he is not scared, that they have nothing to worry about. Look at us. We're drinking wine and having a party. We are feasting while that army is outside going through their provisions. Nothing can hurt us. Trust me, I'm the man. I am the man. You can follow me as he drinks from the vessel of the house of God. And I kind of get that sense that he's saying, who's the man? And the elders are going, Belshazzar. Who's the man? And they say, Belshazzar. And they're whipping themselves up into a frenzy, convincing themselves that they can't be defeated, that nothing is going to happen to them i think it's a morale building party is what it is they're trying to gather the troops and let everybody know that they're going to be okay despite the army that is sitting outside of the gates right now but i think there's an application in here for us here's the application that i felt like the lord showed me he showed me personally and I think he would have it for a lot of us as well. I see a lot of this going on in our culture today as I'm watching with Belshazzar right here. The application is this. Don't try to medicate your problems away. Let them lead you back to the gospel. You see, Belshazzar's got a problem right now. His name is Cyrus. He's outside the gates with that army, okay? Belshazzar's father who was the king before him, or probably the ruling king, and Belshazzar's the co-regent. I might tell you about that in a little while. He, he's already been defeated. His name was Nabonidus. He's already been defeated by this army and been deposed and probably exiled. And now Belshazzar is sitting inside the walls trying to build up his courage, and he's getting drunk while he's doing it. Now, what is it that you do to medicate your problems away? You know what I like to do? You can ask my wife. If, if, if things get too much for me, if I feel like they're too much, if I grow anxious and those types of things, I like to eat and I like to sleep. I want to eat what I want to eat, when I want to eat it, how I want to eat it. You know what I'm saying? Dunkin' Donuts calling my name right over here, right? And to be honest with you, I don't want to confront my problems. I want to go to sleep because when I go to sleep, what's the deal? I'm not worried about my problems. I'm not thinking about my problems. I want food because it makes me feel good, and I want to go to sleep because it makes me forget. What do you do to self-medicate when your problems are more than you can handle? Listen, the problems are still going to be there. 
The only real solution is my intimacy with my Heavenly Father. So that's my place of security and peace in the midst of my problems. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, I think relates to this. For we know that if the earthly tent, that is our bodies, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. The idea here, people, is this. In this world, there will be tribulation. In these bodies, we groan. We long to be redeemed. This world will never be our satisfaction, so we can never medicate all of our problems away. We have to learn how to pursue our Heavenly Father in the midst of any and every one of our problems and suffering. Amen? And I think there's a lesson in that for all of us, although we may all medicate in different ways. Back to verse 5. Y'all see that? We end in on verse 4. <laughs> That's how we do. Uh huh. Let's don't get prideful now. This is a message about humility. We've got a long way to go here today. Verse 5. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall at the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Now, by implication, does it appear that there's a man attached to the hand? Yes or no? No. It just appears that a hand appears. And the light, probably, of these torches that are lighting the room among this drunken party and starts writing on the plaster of the wall. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack. Has that ever happened to you? Was it painful? The original language says that his loins were loosened. <laughs> That's what it says in the original language. The, the guess here is one of two things, okay? One of two things. I'm going to tell you the first one first because I think it's a little funny. And I'm going to tell you the second one because I actually think that's probably what happened. The first possible interpretation is that he needed a change of shorts, okay? Because <laughs> his loins went loose. That's as far as I'm going to take that this morning. Second possibility is that he, in a, he almost fainted. Like he lost the ability to stand on his own two legs. You know what I'm saying? Because of the type of emotional shock that he experienced when a hand not attached to a person starts writing on the wall of this room that they're having the party in. And his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The word aloud means in power and in strength. It's not like, hey, can, can, somebody, get the, can somebody get the guys that interpret the dreams and bring them in here? This was more like the monarch who feels like he's losing control of his kingdom and in fear screams at everybody in this bravado type of anger. Get my, get my intellectuals in here. Get the Chaldeans and get the, bring them in here right now. Because he's trying to build himself up out of the fear that he's in now. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain this interpretation to me should be clothed with purple have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have authority as the third ruler of the kingdom. Why the third? His father Nabonidus was probably the king. He was the acting king, or what's known as a co-regent at the time. The third king, the third in power, was the best that he could possibly give in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. I don't know how you're more greatly alarmed than your loins being loosened, but now it's worse. It's worse now. And his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. Then the queen entered the banquet hall. Now, I want you guys to understand, most commentators translate this as the queen mother. In other words, most people do not believe this was Belshazzar's wife. They believe that this was his mom. And a lot of them think that this may have been a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Speculation. 
But check this out. The queen, or the queen mother, entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. Can y'all hear the voice of mom in these words? Can you hear the voice of mom? Let me remind you, your father the king, your king the father, your father the king, he knew this guy. This guy was wise. This guy can interpret things. You might need some help. This was because, verse 12, of an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Can you also hear the respect for Daniel out of the queen mother? Look at how she refers to him. How does the queen mother first refer to him? How? Tell me. By his Hebrew name. And she identifies him then to Belshazzar as Belshazzar. Very close names, very different names, but very close. She identifies him by his Babylonian name, meaning that maybe that's the only way that Belshazzar knew him or had heard of him. But she refers to him as Daniel. She refers to him as being filled with a spirit of the holy gods. She refers to him as being wise and and having this sense of understanding and wisdom. There seems to be respect from her personal knowledge of Daniel's dealings, perhaps with Nebuchadnezzar and with the people of Babylon. Because remember, he was put in charge by Nebuchadnezzar of all the wise men of the kingdom. Verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king. Note the different response of the king. The king said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? Do you see respect in that reply? What does that look like right there? It looks like he's like big boy in him. Like, hey, are, are you, wait a minute, I think I've heard of you. Are you one of the slaves? Are, are you one of the conquered people that we just, we just took you out of your home and marched you over there? Right? Are you one of those guys? Hmm. Now I've heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you're able to give interpretations to solve difficult problems. Now if you're able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you'll be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck and you'll have authority as third ruler of the kingdom. How many of y'all asked why Daniel wasn't in there in the first place? Any of y'all ask that question? I think the kingdom has moved on from Daniel in these years since Nebuchadnezzar died. You see, Daniel had great esteem in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. But when you have the next pagan king, and the next pagan king, and the next pagan king, guess who gets knocked down the list of possible authoritative places in the kingdom? Daniel's still around, but it does not appear he's in charge. He may not have any role at all. I don't know. But he wasn't called in among this initial group of wise men, although some still know of him. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. What do you all think about Daniel's response? I kind of like it. I kind of like it. It gave me a little, you know, it gave me a little uh, shades of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Like, you can do what you want to with us, homie, you know, but we're not bowing down. They said homie in the Aramaic. (laughs) Like, no joke, go look it up. And, And even if God does not rescue us, we're still not bowing down before the statue. We're just, we're just not doing it. 
Now, I've got to tell you guys, looking at Daniel's character, I do not believe that this was a prideful response from Daniel. I think it can kind of read that way, okay? But I, I don't believe that this was a prideful response by Daniel. I say that on the basis, again, of his character. But I would also say that this is simply a response to, to tell the king that, hey, your gifts don't matter. You cannot bribe me to give you an interpretation. I'm simply going to give you the right interpretation because I don't give a rip about gold or jewels or purple or you know, scarlet or robes or whatever else you want. I just don't care. But I'm going to tell you exactly what this means, and it will not be the result of any type of payment that you give me. I think it's just impartial. Now here's an application I want to make based on this absence of Daniel in the scripture, and maybe from a, a role in Babylon for this time. And I want us each to think about this. Here's the way I said it. Don't grow discouraged. Always be prepared to testify. Don't grow discouraged. When Daniel starts his ministry in Babylon, he's probably a 15-year-old kid. He is elevated, and he climbs the ranks very quickly to a place of influence, Right? And he's always pointing, if you look at his language, he's always pointing the people and he's pointing Nebuchadnezzar back to the Lord. He's pointing him back to the gospel. He's praising God for everything that he's been given, everything that he does, every dream that he interprets, everything. He's always ministering and pointing it back to God. Well, what do you think the risk was for Daniel as he moves into his 60s and his 70s and his 80s and he no longer has a place of position or authority? And instead of being known as the man who is filled with the spirit of the holy gods who, serves, who, who solves riddles and enigmas and interprets dreams and is the wisest man in all of the kingdom, he just becomes in his old age that guy who was in exile from Judah. What do you think is the risk in his own heart? What am I doing here anymore? How is my time being redeemed? What purpose do I have anymore? Yet, when he gets called into the throne room of Belshazzar, does he have an answer? Yes or no? Yes. That man was prepared. He was ready to his last day to do whatever the Lord had for him in his life. 1 Peter 3 would say it this way in verse 14, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. I would say this to the older people in our congregation. Do not ever think as long as the Lord has chosen to continue to give you breath that he does not have a possible use for that next breath. Okay? And I would also say to the younger in our congregation that maybe haven't learned this, okay? The people that you desire to ministry, that to minister to, maybe in your family, maybe in your job, maybe at your school, wherever is your sphere of influence, and you just think, when is that opportunity ever going to come? I don't see it. When's the opportunity going to come? It's been years. It's even been decades in some cases. Here's the idea. When the stuff really gets bad, when the circumstances people like Belshazzar don't think they can overcome them, that is the time that they will go to you. If you have maintained your integrity, okay, that is the time they will come to you and they will ask for help. When they reach the bottom, when they are urgent, when they are in distress. And sometimes we have to just stay in a state of readiness so that we're prepared to make a defense when the person is actually ready to be able to hear the answer that we have to give to them. You understand? There's application in this to all of us. Verse 18. See, we left off on verse 17. O King, the Most High God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the people's nations and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. Whomever he wished, he spared alive. Whomever he wished, he elevated. Whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became... Now, I want to define a couple of these terms because I want you all to hear the definition of these terms and see how they relate to us. It's too easy for us to say we're not prideful. 
We are. I am. We are. Okay? Listen to the description of these terms. His spirit became so proud. In the original language, proud means strong. It means to become hardened. He strengthened his heart. He became, let me put another word to it, he tried to become self-sufficient. He tried to become self-sustaining. He became strong. His spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly. Now this isn't just men, but I'm looking at a lot of the men in the room on this one. Arrogantly means to seethe or to boil over. How many of us, when we're threatened in our insecurities, the way it comes out in us is anger? That's a go-to for guys, I'm telling you. And that's a description of arrogance in the original language. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne. His glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beasts. His dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets it over whomever he wishes." If you're wondering where all that comes from because you haven't been following along with us, go back and read chapter 4. Yet, you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Humbled means to bring low. Remember? Can never go wrong going low, right? He says, you have not chosen to go low before the God Most High, even though you know what happened to your father Nebuchadnezzar and why it happened to him. But you have exalted yourself, verse 23, against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, or bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand is your life breath, and all your ways you have not glorified. Do you ask yourself why Daniel seems to have so much more mercy for Nebuchadnezzar? than Belshazzar? He does, doesn't he? Like you look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar, and I've told y'all repeatedly that Nebuchadnezzar was a bad dude. But yet when you see Daniel respond to Nebuchadnezzar, it always seems to be in this like, with this outpouring of grace, this overwhelming sense of mercy to this guy who's completely lost and just bad. But with Belshazzar, I don't get that. I don't get words dripping with grace and mercy when he's speaking to Belshazzar. Like if you remember in Daniel chapter 4, he even pleaded with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, when he interpreted the dream, he was alarmed. He was frightened. It was like he had a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar and he didn't want bad things to happen to him. And he pleaded with the king. He said, please, king, here's my counsel to you. Do righteousness. Like, step away from your iniquities and live in righteousness and show mercy to the poor. Do these things and maybe God will relent from the things that are coming your way. I don't get any of that with Belshazzar. What you get with Belshazzar is... You have not gone low, even though you knew all these things. What does that teach us? Well, I think it teaches us this. I'll elaborate a little bit. Three of our greatest teachers in life should be history, should be our elders, and people in authority, and it should be God's Word. And I think... God uses those things to be able to teach and train and instruct us for the sake of righteousness, right? Now, here's the deal. Nebuchadnezzar, in many senses, did not know better. Like Babylon and the lifestyle that he was living before he was confronted with Daniel, that's all he had ever known. 
Belshazzar knew all of the stories of Nebuchadnezzar. He knew that at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life, he wrote a decree to send out to all the people on the earth that said, there is only one God, and he gives kings and kingdoms. He gives power, he takes it away, he makes people rulers, he takes them down, he gives it to the lowliest of men. He is the God most high, and I want you all all to know that, and he has done great things. Belshazzar knew that was the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, knew that his pride was what got him deposed, knew the story of his sanity being taken away from him and all of these things, and yet still did not humble himself. Now let me ask you all, out of all the people in the world, what place in the world is more accountable for how we respond to God than anywhere else on the planet? Maybe Cleveland, Tennessee. Y'all know what I'm saying? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Because we know. We were told. We've grown up with it. The gospel was around us. It was taught to us. We were trained in it. We were told by our parents. We were told by our elders. We were taken to church since we were knee-high to a grasshopper. We were in the door every time the doors were open. It is, it is around us everywhere. And the problem is, and the thing that concerns me greatly for us as a community is, I think it takes our level of accountability and just moves it up to a higher place. I think we have to take that very seriously. Like in our own lives, first of all, and then also in our intercessory prayer life for our entire area. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking like a Daniel 9 type of attitude where we pray that God would have mercy on us who have been entrusted with so much and who have walked so far away from God in so many cases have turned our backs upon God completely or perhaps that we just sit in religious apathy all the time in our churches every single week and do nothing with the gospel. God, forgive us because you've entrusted us with so much. We are highly, highly accountable people. I think Daniel's dealing with Belshazzar as a highly accountable man because he knew a direct story about the gospel and the truth of who is the Most High, and it was not him. Verse 24, Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, Mene, Tekil, Upharsin. I'm sure I said those exactly the way they're pronounced in Aramaic. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. The literal word essentially just means numbered. To kill, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. The original term simply means weighed. Perez. Perez is the singular term for Upharsin that it said earlier. It's essentially the same word, okay? Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Stick with me for just a second. The words literally mean numbered, weighed, divided. That's all it means. Numbered, weighed, divided. Daniel gives the interpretation to the words. Daniel adds the interpretation and he says... God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. There's your interpretation. You got a ring for me now? Give me that robe. Right? You know, I told you before that I do not think Daniel is, is speaking this way out of pride. I don't, I don't think he's doing it in that manner because I don't think that's who Daniel is. But I also want you to know, Daniel also knows, like, the end of the story. You know what I'm saying? Like, he knows the, the, the Median and Persian army is outside the walls. Everybody knows that. But he also knows Daniel chapter 2 has already happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the, the statue, the head of gold, and the chest of the, the four kingdoms, right? He, he already knew that. Besides the fact that you're going to start to see as we move forward, Daniel 7 and 8 are actually chronologically happened before what we're reading in Daniel 5. So he has already seen other visions Daniel has in the last 10 years that have already reminded him that the other kingdoms are coming. 
So Daniel may not know that it's going to happen the next day, but he knows the end of the story. Bro, you in a world of hurt. Can't stop it. Can't do nothing about it. Too late. Should have gone low earlier. Too late now. Then Belshazzar, verse 29, gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was slain, so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. Multiple historians agree on the big picture of what happened with Babylon. And they will tell you that Babylon could have withstood a siege for years and years and years, if not decades, because of the resources that they had inside and with the Euphrates flowing through Babylon and with those walls that there was no technology to overcome. They could have withstood a siege for a long time. Yet the scripture records to, uh, for us that Belshazzar died that night. And the kingdom changed hands. Multiple historians agree that what Cyrus did is he took a group of his men and he took them upriver. And he blockaded the river and basically diverted much of it off to a swamp area outside of Babylon. And overnight, while all the people in Babylon were drunk and sleepy because of what their, their little party they had trying to boost their morale the night before, they simply walked in under the gates of iron that were, went down part of the way in the Euphrates River that, that blocked people from coming in. They walked into the city, and they probably only killed a very few people. But the next day, there was a new king in charge, and Belshazzar died. Why? Because God is the ruler of the heavens and the earth, and he gives kings and kingdoms to whoever he desires at whatever point he desires for whatever purpose he desires. You know what I'm saying? And that's what the scripture has told us over and over again. Now, as we lead into our last couple points of application, don't think you're getting out of here real quick, because one of these points of application is more like 12. So don't get fidgety. In verse 31, it says, So Darius the Mede received the kingdom. I want you to know Darius the Mede is one of the great points of biblical criticism of the book of Daniel. A lot of people will say there is no Darius the Mede in history. Therefore, another evidence that this is all just a made-up story from some Jewish guy, you know, circa 165 B.C. or whatever. Well, they used to say that about Belshazzar as well, right? Like, for most of history, nobody knew of a king named Belshazzar. And I told y'all this in the beginning of Daniel, so forgive me if y'all have heard me talk about this. But there was a discovery in the mid-1800s of what was called the Cyrus Cylinder and the Nabonidus Chronicles. And you take these two together, and basically what it records for us is that uh, although we did not know through much of known history, it records for us that there was a king named Nabonidus who had a son named Belshazzar. Nabonidus made Belshazzar his co-regent, which means like an acting ruler in charge. Nabonidus went out and did his thing for like the better part of 10 years and then was conquered by Cyrus. And so Belshazzar was the acting king, just as God's word had said for thousands of years, although history did not record there even was such a man. Well, history now... By the way, they weren't even translated until the mid-1900s, so we didn't even know that this was legit and that it was historical according to secular history until the mid-1900s. So now the Darius the Mede did not even exist. There's arguments around it. Whatever. Cool. But let's just say this. Your first point of application as we close over the next hour is that God's word is trustworthy. God's word is trustworthy. These kingdoms, these kings, these events, okay? Like, we did not have historical documentation of these things before the Bible, and then history has continually verified these things over and over and over again. And yet people want to continue to criticize. 
I want you to understand, if you hear the sound of my voice right now, God's Word is reliable, and it has proven itself to be reliable over thousands of years, over and over and over and over again, despite being the most heavily scrutinized work in the history of mankind, beyond compare. And I want to point you out, I want to point this out to you. These will be up on the screen, but just follow me because I'm going to do this really quickly. Isaiah 13, verse 17 says this. Don't turn in your Bibles. We're going to go too fast. Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them who will not share valuable silver or take pleasure in gold. Their bows will mow down the young men. They will not have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Wait, who? Who got overthrown? Babylon. By who? The Medes. Who took over? Darius the Mede. When was Isaiah written? About 175 years before what we just read in Daniel 5. You understand what I'm saying? God told us what was going to happen before it ever happened. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5. To whom would you liken me? Let me see if I'm in the right one. Yeah. Nope, wrong one. Isaiah chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. There's that phrase again. I've missed that when I was preparing. It just caught me right now. That struck me as real funny. (laughs) That's awesome. That totally proves my point. Is God's word not trustworthy? You know what I'm saying? He said he was going to loose the dude's loins. That is fantastic. (laughs) To open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, make rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. These are what historians say about the gates of Babylon. The gates of bronze, the bars of iron. That's what they talk about in legend about the walls of Babylon. I will give you the treasures of darkness, the hidden wealth of secret places, so that you may know it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. Verse 6, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Verse 13, I have aroused him in righteousness. I will make all his ways smooth. He will build my city and let my exiles go free. Without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. That's even past Daniel, where Cyrus was called to send the exiles back and rebuild the temple, which is confirmed in the scriptures. Jeremiah 25, starting in verse 12. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation declares the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words which I pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. Church, was the 70 years an accurate prophecy about what happened with Babylon? Yes or no? Yes. Jeremiah chapter 51 Verse 56, for the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men will be captured, their bows are shattered. For the Lord is a God of recompense, he will fully repay. I will make her princes and her wise men drunk, her governors, her prefects, and her mighty men. They might sleep in perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the broad wall of Babylon will be completely raised. Her high gates will be set on fire, so the peoples will toil for nothing, and the nations become exhausted only for fire." God's word, predictively, prophetically, told us that Cyrus was going to loosen the loins of the king of Babylon, that Babylon was going to be overthrown, that the gates of iron and the the gates of bronze and the bars of iron were going to be destroyed, and that her princes were going to be drunk. And then Daniel confirms it in real time. And then moving past to the end of the story in Ezra chapter 1, starting in verse 1, It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. By the way, Cyrus was over Darius. Darius may have been ruling in Babylon. Cyrus was the man. 
so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, which he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. How did Isaiah 51 say that Cyrus would complete the mission God gave him? It says, without payment. As a matter of fact, he didn't even receive payment, he gave payment. Cyrus told his own people to give the Jews the money to go and rebuild the nation. You know what I'm saying? Do you do that to a foreign nation? Well, we do it to people all the time, okay? That's, that's like, that got real political real fast, right? You don't do it to nations that you've subjugated in this time. You don't send back money to rebuild their walls and to rebuild their temple and to fortify their defenses. You don't do that. You don't plunder your own people for the sake of another people that you rule over unless God tells the Egyptians to give them everything in their house because I'm taking you to the promised land or he raises up a king like Cyrus who sends out a decree to all the nations and said, hey, give your silver and your gold to the Israelites because I got to build a temple over in Jerusalem. You know what I'm saying? That's some crazy stuff, y'all. And that's historical. It's true. Verse 7, also King Cyrus brought the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Don't name your son that. Now this was their number. 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and 1,000 other articles. 5,400 articles from the temple. Let me tell you all a working theory I have. Not one single holy article from the temple went missing in Babylon. They all got returned. That's my working theory right there. What do you all think about that? Because you know why? God is a God of covenant. God is a promise-keeping God. Those were God's articles. They weren't Marduk's. They weren't Bell's. They weren't Nebuchadnezzar's. They weren't Cyrus's. They weren't Belshazzar's. Those were God's articles. You think you're in charge? You take them? That's fine. I'll get them back. I'll tear down your whole kingdom and put somebody else in charge who will listen to my voice and then we'll know what's what. And that's exactly what he did. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went from Babylon to Jerusalem. God told us in his word what he was going to do with Babylon before, during, and after. Now why am I making a point out of all this? Because if God's word is this trustworthy, then you can trust God's word when he comes to tell you what is truth and what is not. What is right and what is wrong. What pleases him and what displeases him. How we should live our lives and how we not, should not live our lives. What is righteousness and what is sin. What is good, what is bad, what is light, what is darkness, what is good, what is evil. Do you all understand what I'm saying? If God's word is trustworthy here, it is trustworthy simply because it is the standard for truth, and we should submit our lives to it. Amen? Hey, y'all want to talk about a town that's accountable for that right there? We may want to be careful before we clap too much. We are accountable for that truth that you just heard. I don't even have time for this part. Goodness. I'm going to call a little audible. We'll do it really quickly. Because I don't want you to walk away from this. The theme of chapters 4 and 5 is that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So the question that we have to ask is, how do we humble ourselves before God so that we can be recipients of his grace and not his opponents? Because nobody can oppose God. Nobody can stand up to him. How do we humble ourselves? I'm going to give you some different examples of how you can humble yourselves. 
how I can humble myself before God, okay? I want you to understand this is a personal responsibility. We have to submit ourselves to God's Word. I'm going to share with you the Scripture. You can go do the homework, right? You can go do the homework. First, how to humble ourselves. We can mourn our sin. Blessed are those who mourn, right? The Beatitudes, it is the mourning and the weeping over sin. Do you practice, and another way to put this, do you practice repentance, okay? Like, when's the last time you repented? Was it this morning? Was it yesterday? Was it a week ago? Was it a month ago? Do you practice repentance or mourning over the sin in your life? James 4, 9 tells us to be miserable and mourn and weep. It's speaking about over our sin. How to humble yourself. Here's the second one. You've got to watch your mouth. James 4, 11 goes on to say, do not speak against one another. If you go back to James 3, it says the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. We slay people with the tongue. And I want you to understand, because I'm paraphrasing very quickly all of these verses, every verse that I'm about to share with you guys, and these principles for us walking in humility that I'm sharing with you, they all come out of the context of humility. That's why you can go do the homework to see if I'm telling you right, okay? They all come out of this context of humility. If I want to humble myself before God, I need to practice repentance for my sin. I need to mourn over sin. I need to watch my mouth so that I won't slander and speak ill of other people or gossip. I need to, here's a third one, I need to practice submission. I need to submit to my authorities. Now again, there are times and places. I know y'all want a lot of explanation for that one. But in general, 1 Peter 2.18, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, they tell us, in fact, one of those places tells us to submit to our masters, even the wicked ones. Daniel did that. Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked man when he first encountered him. And he submitted to him in everything that did not cross a black and white biblical line. We can learn from that. How to humble yourself. Here's a fourth one. We need to take our anxieties to him in prayer. You'll find that in 1 Peter chapter 5. You'll find it in Philippians chapter 4. You also see it in 2 Chronicles 32. An army of the Assyrians is about to crush Israel. But King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, prayed about this and cried out to heaven. And God fought back the armies of Assyria with an angel. They didn't even have to fight the battle themselves. If you want to humble yourself, when you face those problems that you're trying to control the outcome of, take your problems and your anxieties back to your heavenly Father. Seed control to him. And I need you to understand, and a lot of y'all have heard me say this before, arrogance is not the only manifestation of pride. Trying to control with our fear all of our problems, insecurity is another manifestation of pride because it's me saying that I have to be in control. And I'm not. And neither are you. How to humble yourself. I don't know, we might be on 5 or 8 or 12 or something. Serve others. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Don't look out for your own interests, but elevate the interests of others. Let me ask you a very direct question. How are you elevating the interests of others over yourself in your life? There should be practical answers to that question. And if not, you've got to find some, Okay? Because one of the greatest ways we can humble ourselves before God is to serve. Is to serve. And I'm not just talking about serving in see kids or, you know, cleaning a bathroom or something. I'm just talking about serving. And there's a multitude of ways to do that. Last one I'm going to give you this morning. How to humble yourself. Choose to forgive others as you have been forgiven. Struggling with bitterness struggling with unforgiveness towards someone in your life, there's not a lot more humbling thing than to choose to forgive in the manner that you have been forgiven. And let me remind you of how you have been forgiven. The gospel of the goodness of God says that if you're willing to confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. 
that Jesus came for us not because of our worth, not because of our value, not because of our performance, but he came for us while we were yet sinners. That his forgiveness for us was unconditional. And it takes great humility to be able to forgive other people unconditionally when they have wounded us as well. So that being said, why don't you bow? That was real quick. I want to pray that God would impress some of these principles, if not even one, upon each one of us before we worship and minister to each other this morning. Father God, we know that your word said that you are opposed to the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Father, may we be a people who are not opposed to you, but may we be filled with grace and mercy for others. May you be the source of that filling. Father God, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may have an answer and that we may be servants and vessels of grace to others. And Father, I pray in this time, despite the brevity of the time, that any of these principles, the mourning of sin, the serving of others, the forgiveness of those that we're holding grudges against, the submission to authority, any of them. Father, would you impress any of these principles upon your people, upon me? Would you minister to them and bring conviction to each of us as we have need? Father, to the end, that we would be the recipients of your great grace that you lavish upon your people. But help us to go low. Help us to go low. Father, we praise and honor you as the God most high, the God who gives and takes away. Blessed be your name. In this time, minister to us as we have need, and may we be ministers to you as we bring our sacrifice of praise and worship. We thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.